Thank you, Tony. Thank you, worship team. Got a couple of kids from Malaria with us today, which is really nice, right? Our Malaria kids playing in the band. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, Bree's a, a woman. Oh, well, <laughs> right. I get confused who's old and who's young. So. She's a grown woman. <laughs> oh, okay. So, yeah. So good to have Bree with us. Yeah, great to have our team. Thank you so much for leading us beautifully in worship. Uh, if you're uh, here for the first time, which I know we have some visitors, I want to welcome you. My name is Jason Russ. I'm the pastor here at Lorraine Campus. And uh, as a team, we're just so happy to have you with us. And I hope you'll take the chance this morning, if you're new, to in, in the little um, slot in front of you, there's a, either a, a connection card, which we'd love to connect with you and give you a chance to, to get in the flow of what's happening, our Monday emails, and, and just so we know you're here so we can pray for you. There's also prayer request cards in there you can fill out as well. And so uh, make sure to connect with us. It'd be great today. But um, we have our kids with us right now. I want to invite the kids up. We're going to have story time with Pastor Jason. You guys want a little story time? All right, so, so children that are going to go to kids' church, come on up here and sit on the floor. All right, there we are. Excelente. And uh, come on up, guys. Come on up. Anybody that's going to go to kids, uh, the kids' church after this, come on up and join me. Sit in the front. Watch your coffee there, Siege. And uh, we'll be good. Awesome. Now, make sure you can see the screen because I'm going to have the pictures for the book up here for everybody to see, but I'll also show them to you here, okay? But it's going to look better up there. But this book is a book that I picked up a few years ago when, when um, I was at a conference with uh, my buddy Bill Cornish, and uh, we went out and um, th- I got to meet this, this author. Her name is Trillia Newbell, uh, and I just absolutely love this book because it's really everywhere we were visiting that we were this week when we were uh, in our sports camp. The story of the week is right here in this book, and, and really where Paul's been taking us in the book of Ephesians is right here. So we're going to read it together. You guys ready for a story? Yeah! Awesome. Okay, so it's God's very good idea, and it begins in the beginning. All right, need my glasses because I'm old. Here we go. In the beginning, in fact, before the beginning... God had a very good idea. You see that very good idea right there? It was an even better idea than solar panels of 1954, the super soaker of 1982, uh, chocolate chip cookies, 1938, color TV of 1942. How about fireworks of 700 BC? That's a long time ago that fireworks came about. The life raft of 1880, roller skates of 1760, or the x-ray machine of 1895. Wow. You see, God's idea was to make people, lots of people, lots of different people who would all enjoy loving him and all enjoy loving each other. Look, my page even has more people on it. Crazy, huh? Lots of people. They would all be made in his image. They would all be like mirrors reflecting what God is like. Because God is full of love, they would be full of love too. So God got to work, and he made a beautiful world for people to live in. Then he made the first people, a man and a woman. And he said to them, be happy. Enjoy loving me and enjoy loving each other. Have a huge family that will fill the earth and look after the earth and enjoy the earth. And so God carried on creating people. See, all of them were made in his image and all of them were different too. Some were men, some were women. Some liked reading. Some had darker skin, some had lighter skin. Some liked riding bikes, and then some had curly hair, and some had straight hair. Interesting, huh? And we live in God's world. We are all different, but we are also all the same. Everyone you see is different than you, and they are the same as you. They might look different or speak different or play different, but they are all made in God's image, and so they are all valuable. Did you guys know you're all valuable to God? You're all valuable. So this is God's very good idea, but people ruined God's very good idea. (gasps) Look at that picture. The first people chose to not love God. This is called sin. And because they chose not to love God as they should, they forgot how to love each other as they should. We're all the same. We choose not to love God, and so we are not able to love each other like we should. We sin. Sometimes we treat each other badly because they're different than us, right? People fight with each other. People are mean to each other. People laugh at each other. That ever happened to you guys? Yeah, it does happen, doesn't it? 
Because we have ruined God's very good idea, he's not pleased with us. Our sin means that we can't be friends with him or enjoy living with him like Adam and Eve did. We need God's forgiveness for ruining his very good idea. It's the same for everybody in the world, not just us, everybody. People who like reading need forgiveness. People who like riding bikes need forgiveness. People with dark skin need forgiveness. People with lighter skin need forgiveness. People with curly hair need forgiveness, and people with straight hair need forgiveness. But God was not done. He was not surprised by people ruining things. He'd always had a very good plan to rescue his very good idea. So God got to work. Guess what he did, guys? Look up here. He came to earth as a person. What's that name right there? Jesus. Everybody say it with me. Jesus. Yes, he came to earth as a person named Jesus. And look what Jesus did. Jesus loved people who were different than him. He loved people who nobody else loved. Just like the woman, he said, he, he, your faith has made you well. Or like the man he healed who was blind. And, he, and the guy said, I can see, right? And look at this, look at this. He always enjoyed loving all the different people he met. Jesus shows us how to enjoy loving each other. Isn't that cool? But people didn't love Jesus. Instead, they hated him. This is the sad part. They put him on a cross to die, but this was also part of God's plan. Look at this picture. On the cross, Jesus took our sin so that we can be forgiven. Jesus forgives his people for their sins. Isn't that awesome? So Jesus didn't stay dead. Instead, he rose back to life, came back to life. He went back to heaven to live with the Father, and he gave people his spirit to help them enjoy loving him and loving all the different people they know. Look at this. Jesus helps us to love one another. Look at these pictures of helping and loving. Isn't that awesome? Jesus helps us to love one another. One day, God will finish his very good idea. Jesus will come back and make the world perfect again. Anyone who has asked Jesus to forgive them will live there with their different languages, their different skin colors. They'll enjoy loving God and loving each other. They will enjoy praising God for making, rescuing, and finishing his very good idea. This is a very good idea, isn't it, guys? Yes? Yes, it is. But here's a very, 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 very important part and a good part of God's very good plan. You don't have to wait until then to enjoy it. Jesus welcomes anybody who asks him to forgive them, and when Jesus welcomes someone, he welcomes them into his family forever. He welcomes people who like reading, people who like riding bikes. He welcomes people with darker skin, people with lighter skin. He welcomes people with curly hair and people with straight hair. And guess what? This is God's family. God's family is called the church. Your church your church friends are your brothers and sisters. Look around right here on the floor and say, hi, brother, hi, sister. This is your church family. Your brothers and sisters, your wonderful and colorful church family. Listen, kids, you can enjoy loving them. You can enjoy loving them and loving God with them. This is God's very good idea. Look at the picture. Lots of different people enjoying loving him and loving each other. God made it, people ruined it, he rescued it, and he will finish it. And with your church family, look up here, last page, with your church family, you can enjoy being a part of it right now. Isn't that good news? Yeah. Are you guys ready for some more family time now? Yeah. All right, okay. Then you get up and you can head out with Miss Stephanie in the back. Let's give the kids a hand. Woo. All right, great job, kids. All right, God's very good idea, Trillia Newbell. I can't recommend her writings enough. Um, and this, actually, that story gets us right back to where Pastor Jim's been walking us as we've been going through Ephesians chapter uh, 4, and really the whole letter of the Ephesians has been filled with this concept that it's not a me, me, I, 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 me, me faith. Uh, that it's not a letter about just my walk with Christ. It's a letter to the church. It's a letter about us 
uh, about us being the church, okay? It's about the we in the room, all right? So we're going to look on kind of both those levels today, though, applying to you and your heart as an individual Christian, but also applying it to us. And I'm going to say as a campus, not, not to exclude the other campuses, but today we're talking very focused. I'm talking just to you, Lorraine Campus, not all the campuses. So it's time for some reflection on the individual and on the corporate that is both of our services, Lorraine Campus, right? And so, Holy Spirit, just guide us. Thank you for this story that, that really drives home what you've done for us, Father. Your very, very good idea of rescuing us, of making us and rescuing us and how you are going to finish it. And you've left us in this beautiful place called the family of God, the church. Open our hearts to what Paul's talking about when he speaks of that beautiful, beautiful family. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, get your Bibles and let's get into where Paul has t- been taking us. I'm going to back up and get a running start in Ephesians 4. We're going to start in verse 11. So Ephesians 4:11. if you have your Bible or on the app there, go ahead and bring it up. And let's stand together on our feet one more time. And we do this to honor God's word. And let me just take you back. Again, we'll take a running start into verse 11. Because it, it, it's a, if we just started in verse 13, it's in the middle of a thought. So we got to start at 11 where Paul is saying, can everybody see this okay? Do I need to back it up a little bit? Is that okay? Is that better? Okay, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. And that's what we've been spending the past couple weeks on, is this whole concept that it's not just about these, these equippers, it's about who they're equipping. That's you. That's you, Okay. And it's about what God wants to do with those people who have been equipped. We equip to serve so that the body of Christ might be built up. It's the bodybuilding of the the people of God, right? That's what Paul's been talking about. And here's the, the thought continues now, today's verses 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Continuing on, verse 14, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and the craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. But instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head. That is Christ. Verse 16, from him, from Christ, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Now, Paul makes it very clear that there is a goal in mind. There is a goal in mind when it comes to all this equipping that the pastors and teachers and evangelists are are pouring into the church so that you can be equipped to do good works and to be built up, right? There's this amazing equipping that's happening, and there's a point to it. The goal of that equipping is that we might be mature, Maturity is the goal. That is the, the, the bottom line that he's getting to in this passage as, he, as we start verse 13, is that the, the point is that we become mature. Look at the passage again. It's right there. It's central to verse 13. We're, we're being equipped until we all reach unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. That's the whole goal, is that we mature. Now, I guess the question is, what does that look like? And as I was looking at verses 11 and 12 leading into this, where Jim took us last couple of weeks, as I'm thinking that, that Paul's doing this great talk of building the body or bodybuilding. I don't know if there's any bodybuilders in this room, but uh, when you are one that's working on the body, whether it's for the purpose of showing off your body as a bodybuilder, which I'm a poor example, or uh, maybe you're getting your body ready for you know, a marathon, or maybe you're trying to get your body ready to just go on a hike, you know, maybe you're going get, to get ready to go on a long hike, you know, uh, maybe you're in a sport or something like that, but, but we, in many ways, try to build our body for certain tasks to do certain things, and there's a right way to do it, and there's a wrong way to do it, right, and so you can't just focus on the muscles and the parts that you're trying to get in shape without thinking about things like nutrition, right, and there's no shortcuts, right, as, as the, uh, the debacles in sports teach us with, with steroids, there's no shortcuts. It always is going to catch up with you eventually, right? You've got to focus on the right things, and it's got to be a holistic approach. And that's what Paul is really building here for us in this bodybuilding of the church. It's got to be holistic. We've got to focus on, on everybody 
and we've got to build the body up equally. I mean, imagine a person that says, I'm a mature person physically, and yet, you know, their head's a, a, an adult size, but then they got a right arm that looks like a kid size, and then they got a fully developed right arm or left arm, and then imagine a, an adult foot with a kid foot. I mean, just imagine that if those proportions were out of whack, we'd look at that person and be like, hmm, interesting. Okay, what happened there? You know, certain parts of their body didn't mature. And that is kind of the picture of what has happened in the church over time, is that there's some parts that are mature, some that aren't. And Paul is calling us all out, saying, we've got to all make it our goal to get towards maturity. What does that look like, though? What's well, this building up of the body? Okay, let's take, get back to our notes. Bodybuilding, all right, of the church. And that's, that's when, I, when I speak of bodybuilding, I'm speaking of all that equipping that's happening from pastors, teachers, evangelists, going into the church towards us being built up to do good works for the kingdom, right? Being the presence of Jesus in the world. That's what we're talking about. That's bodybuilding that leads to unity. Okay, so all this equipping and building up of the, of the church is what leads to our unity. Isn't that interesting to think about? You know, we, we can't just shortcut it and say, well, I don't need to be equipped. I don't need any of that stuff. I don't need to go to church. If you don't do those things, if you don't allow yourself to be equipped by those teachers and, and elders and pastors and all that, then guess what's happening is you're going to shortcut unity. It's not going to happen. So this has to happen in order for unity to be found. But what kind of unity? Let's take a look at the text. We all are to reach unity, verse 13. And then we have two prepositional phrases I want you to be sure not to miss. Unity in the faith and, there's your conjunction, in the knowledge of the Son of God. Now, don't, don't miss this, okay? To write this down in your notes, and we'll come back to it. Unity of the faith is the first focus, and then unity of knowledge. But I want you to write that down and think about this. I could be a really good televangelist and tell you that we all need to have faith. We gotta have faith. Oh, and we all gotta gain knowledge. We gotta gain knowledge. And I could never tell you anything more about what that faith entails and what that knowledge entails, but I bet I could get you to get, open your pocketbooks and give me lots of money towards faith and knowledge, and we could be people of faith and people of knowledge, and I could be very, you know, I could be very convincing but what's the thing I'm missing? You're missing there. What are you missing? Faith and knowledge in what, right? Faith and knowledge in what? Because this is what I want you not to miss. I want to go back and show you what Paul says. Faith, this is that collective, that collective understanding, that collective conviction of something that we all believe in. It has an object, right? Um, it's something that you would die for, all right? This is something that's deep within you. And then in the knowledge, knowledge is so important. Knowledge, everything starts with the mind. Uh, we must build our knowledge in many things. Many of you that work in different specialized fields, you gotta build up your knowledge, don't you? Okay, but knowledge is so important because this, this mind of ours is the gateway into our hearts, isn't it? And so we have to have this faith and knowledge, but they always have to have an object. Our faith must have an object. Knowledge must have an object that we focus on. Paul sets it up, of the Son of God. So faith of the Son of God and knowledge of the Son of God. And that's how we become mature. What is the object of your faith? I'm asking you this morning. What is the object of your knowledge? Because often what happens and why we have immature parts of the body is because some people don't get that. They have their faith in something else. They have their knowledge in something else. For some of us, our faith is in ourselves, to be honest. For some of us, our faith is in some person and personality. They may even use the Bible every now and then, but we don't, you know, they're, they're not founded in Christ, right? Uh, for some of us, our knowledge is, is just all poured into what we do, what our occupation is. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But if our knowledge is not being invested in who, what God has given us in his word, then guess what happens? We shortcut, we don't become mature because our, our, our focus is on something other than the Son of God, okay? Our object of faith and knowledge must be Jesus. And so Paul goes on, the knowledge of the Son of God, and we become mature, and this is, I'll go forward again, unity of faith, unity of knowledge, and now look what he says, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. I love this picture. I love the picture that Paul gives here, this idea that 
if you, and again, if you've been with us on the, on the Chosen study we've been doing on Wednesday nights, by the way, we're back this Wednesday night. Uh, so please, all of you are invited. Don't worry that you've missed an episode. It's going to be episode six, I think, this Wednesday night, 6.30. It's so good. But when you watch the, the, the TV series, The Chosen, what's neat about it is that you get to see what it might have been like for these men and these women to walk with Jesus and to experience him in all his fullness, in the flesh and blood, right? And we're kind of jealous when we watch it, like, why? Oh, it'd be so cool to be with Jesus, to be able to spend like a week with him, let alone three years. But Jesus walked in the flesh. I mean, don't just take the Bible's word for it. It's, it's in historical record in many, I mean, a hundred times over that he existed and he walked the earth and he spoke and did what he did. It's not just the Bible, it's historians, it's people that spoke to it. 500 people saw him and witnessed his resurrection. I mean, so he was here in all his fullness. But Paul is saying here that God's very good idea was that, that the church ought to be in the fullness of, of Christ, that we would live in the fullness of Christ. So, that, so much so that when people see the body of Christ, they can actually experience what we wish we could experience with Jesus actually feel his flesh and blood and see him in the flesh again. That is what he means for the church to experience. Now, you know, what, could it, what does that look like? What does the fullness of Christ look like? And that's a question that Pastor Jim and, and some of our leaders were asking many years ago and trying to think, you know, how can we get the fullness and who Christ is in, in a nutshell so that we can understand it? Why do that? Here's, here's the reason why. We've been doing a lot of sports this week, so I've got sports analogies swimming through my head. You ever been in a... In a how, many, how many of you played soccer or basketball or baseball or, or any sport with, with a scoreboard when you were young or, or in the past? Anybody? All right, we've all played sports. And we all know that the scoreboard is very important, but if you ignore the scoreboard, are you a good teammate or a bad teammate if you ignore the scoreboard? Okay. I'd say you're bad. I mean, there are times to ignore the scoreboard, especially if you're losing really badly, okay? But, but most of the time, the scoreboard is, is the thing that we ought to keep our eye on because it motivates us for good or bad. Even if we're losing really bad, for, I know some of my buddies that are like, man, when they're down, they get angry. And when they get angry, they get focused. They don't lose control. They get focused. And I've seen you know, guys like that come back and sink three after three after three because they're down so much. And then before you know it, they're back in the game. This is our scoreboard. The fullness of Christ. You know, we sat down and, and, and Pastor Jim was like, let's get in, in, in writing you know, who Jesus was. What does the fullness of Christ look like? So we have a scoreboard to look at, all right? And that's what I want to go through with you right now. We've talked about this before, but I want you to write it down so you don't forget it. What does it look like? And, and, and here, let me say this also caveat. We, we can't put Jesus in a box. It's not just six characteristics that describe Jesus and there's nothing else to say about Jesus. He's so much more, he's so much more glorious than this. But this is, a, this is a scoreboard for us to be able to understand and to be able to see the character of Jesus, okay? The fullness of Christ looks like this. We're gonna do it in an acronym, C-H-R-I-S-T, and so the first, the first one is C, Jesus, in his life, as we watch him, he was connected to the Father. Now, how was he connected to the Father? And I, I ran out of room, so I want you to write this in. The word and prayer is how he was connected to the Father. And, and so what do I mean by that? As you read the Gospels, I highly recommend you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, as you watch Jesus' life, he absolutely was connected to God through the word, always quoting Genesis, always quoting the Psalms, always quoting many of the books of the, the Pentateuch, and, and he, was, he was absolutely just saturated in the word of God. He had it memorized. At times, he got scrolls out, and he would read it, and then he would teach it. I mean, he was unbelievable in the way in which he was just, uh, just caught up in the word all the time, every day. And then in prayer, Half the time, the, the disciples couldn't find him in the morning because he would wander off. And, and it was so funny. When I said this last hour, little Cora, uh, our little um, mascot of the first uh, service, she wandered off from her parents and came up here and got a ball when I said that. And I, I was so cute. And I'm like, oh, she can have the ball. Take it. Take all the balls. Cora's so cute, right? But I mean, that's, you know, Jesus, Jesus actually would wander off because for him, the greatest thing in the day for him was not the ball, but getting over and getting alone with the Father. That was his highlight of every day. And he would start the day and say, Father, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to say? 
Who do you want me to meet? You know, it wasn't just chance occurrences that Jesus would meet Zacchaeus or the woman at the well. It wasn't just, oops, random. No, he had talked about the father, about that person with the father that morning. And that's why he went to that town. Do you understand what I'm saying? Everything was purposeful. He was connected to the father. Uh, I'm going to say too much. Let's go on to H, heart of worship. Jesus was a man who was full of worship. Therefore, so must we be full of worship. Now, am I talking just about the, the last half an hour where you spent singing? No, I'm not just talking about that. I am talking about that, but I'm talking about so much more than that. Worship is about the way we live. When Jesus walked with his disciples, he's walking and talking to them. He would say, hey guys, check out that, that vineyard there. Let me tell you about how you should be connected to me. John chapter 15. You should be connected to me like a vine is. And, and I am the, my father's a vine dresser and I'm the vine and you are the branches. Jesus would be walking along and say, you see the, the lilies of the field over here? Okay, you see those lilies of the field? Let me tell you about them. They're here today, gone tomorrow, but just like that. You know, and he would just go on and, and he would speak in nature about nature as he saw things and he was just worshiping the Father. All the time he saw the Father in everything he did and he spoke about it. We need to have a heart of worship. R, he relates to other people. He doesn't retreat from other people. He relates to other people. How? Others-centered love. Others-centered where he denies himself in his own words, takes up his cross, and he, and he follows the Father, and he loves others. He puts their needs before his own. That's what Jesus did all the time. Even on the cross, hanging there, says to John, look at your mother, referring to his mother. She is your mother. Look at your son. And he takes care of his mom from the cross. He forgives everybody from the cross, other-centered to the end. I, intentional evangelism, Jesus was incredibly intentional. Like I said, the father directed him and where he was going every day. And he was intentional. Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. You know, he found himself intentional, went to a Pharisee's house. Why would he go to a Pharisee's house? They were his enemy. He would go to a Pharisee's house. He would break bread with them. them. He'd break bread with the tax collectors, with prostitutes, with the, the, the worst of the worst and the best of the best. He was intentional about who he reached out to, even washing Judas's feet the one that would betray him. He was intentionally evangelizing, reaching out to the last moment possible, loving people. S, spirit-led servant. Spirit-led servant. Jesus was a spirit-led. I mean, over and over again, you see him full of the spirit at the very beginning of his ministry. The spirit led him into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to fast and pray in preparation for his ministry. All the way until, you know, throughout his ministry, so many times, full of the spirit, full of the spirit, and he was led by the Spirit of God. We need that as well. And finally, on the scoreboard, T, Jesus was a trustworthy steward of God's resources. He understood that everything he had been given was from his hand, from the hand of the Father, starting with the family he was born into. Listen to me. The family he was born into was not a wealthy family. They were extremely poor. And he saw them as a... As a he was trusted with that family, and he loved his family, and he took care of his family, right? And then he, he even says in his high priestly prayer in John about his disciples that you've given me these ones, and I have taken care of them. I've told them everything you told me to tell them. I've built into them. And he saw the disciples as entrusted to him, okay? And what about you? You've been entrusted with so many things, the breath of our lungs all the way to the the, the, the young ones that God may have given you or the neighbors he's given you, the family he's given you, we've been entrusted with so many things. These are the things that Jesus displayed. This is what maturity looks like, folks. Don't look anywhere else. Just look at Jesus. He is the, he's the scoreboard. He is the one that this is what the fullness of Christ looks like. So evaluate yourself. How are you doing in these areas? How is, how is our campus doing in these areas? And if it's too many to think about, let's just summarize. Here's our C-H-R-E-S-T, but let's make it in three statements. The C and the H can be summarizing basically loving God. Jesus loved the Father. He loved God perfectly. R and the I, loving people, all right? And then finally, the S and the T summarize living surrendered. So if we just say it in those three terms, how are we doing it? Loving God, loving people, and living surrendered. This is our goal. This is, our, this is what maturity looks like, everybody. How are we doing at that as an individual and as a, as a campus? And so Paul goes on then 
And he, he sets up a contrast in the last few verses. And, and it's a very, very good contrast coming out of this. If this is what maturity looks like, if this is what the fullness of Christ looks like in a body, then he wants to, he wants to expose the contrast so you can evaluate yourself a, a little bit better. Here, here he starts in verse 14. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and the craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. And so here he's talking about this picture. And, and somebody tell me in this contrast, what's the image that comes to mind? What, what, what is he borrowing from in, in our world around us? It's something that, happens, that happened in his day on the, on the Mediterranean Sea and in the Sea of Galilee. And it's something that happened yesterday on Lake Erie. What, what's, what's he calling up in our minds? Well, okay, storms, but, but what else? What's being tossed back and forth on the, on the waves? A boat. What, particularly, what kind of boat? In those days, it's not going to be a board with an outboard, uh, outboard motor, right? It's going to be a sailboat, okay? So I was, I was actually conversing with Don Ludwig during my sermon last hour because he's a sail, sailor. He was out yesterday with Joe, and they were doing some sailing. And, uh, and that's the image, is he's talking about uh, a sailboat where the sails are down, okay? And the sail, because the sails are down, every wind that comes and goes is blowing that boat here, blowing that boat there. And, uh, and I asked Don an interesting question. I said, what would be the difference maker? And, and you might think that the difference maker would be to throw the anchor down, right? But this is not the time for the anchor. When the winds are blowing, it's not the time for the anchor. Because what's going to happen is you're going to get anchored and you're going to get bashed and, and beaten up. Don said the thing to do is you open that sail up and you catch the wind, baby, and you go. And the wind, then you, as you harness the wind, it brings, it brings this amazing direction and stability. So that's where Paul's going with this. He's, he's giving us a picture of stunted growth. Too many of us have the sail down. We're, we're in our infancy and we're, we're just per perpetually in childhood. We're perpetually in childhood as believers because our sail is down and we're not catching the wind. We're not going anywhere. Therefore, every time a wind kicks up, we get blown here, we get blown there by every wind of teaching. And, and what that brings is instability and that brings also vulnerability. Paul's talking about the fact that these winds of teaching that come and go are gonna blow us here and there and cause us to be unstable vulnerable to any kind of teaching that comes along. And, and he's worried about a lot of things here. And here's the picture. By every wind of teaching and the cunning and craftiness of people and deceitful scheming. Can anybody think of examples of that in the history of the church? Of times when we've been blown to and from, from this wind and that wind. Uh, think back in your lifetime, maybe, or beyond, of, of, a, of a person or a movement that came along that, got, that blew people along and then they came back to the truth. Any, any examples of that? I'm, I'm asking for a response. Anybody have any examples that come to mind? Jim Jones. Okay, Jim Jones. That's always the first one that comes to my head. The 70s, Jim Jones, yep. The, the church, a lot of people went with that guy and they got, they got uh, unfortunately, they drank the Kool-Aid. You hear that thrown around. But literally that took uh, hundreds of lives of men, women, and children because they got caught up in the charismatic preaching of this man and in a, into a figure, and they, they paid for it with their lives. Any other examples, even in recent times? Uh, Branch Davidians. Okay, the Branch Davidians. David Koresh, yep, uh-huh, yep. And Waco, Texas, back in the 90s. I mean, there's lots of examples in history we can look at. Even more recently, there's a, there's a, um, a podcast out right now that Christianity Today put out called The Rise and the Fall of Mars Hill. Mars Hill is a Seattle church that came on strong in the early 2000s. Mark Driscoll is their pastor. Super big movement. And, in, and the podcast, The Rise and Fall, talks about how they, how they got to their pinnacle and then basically how it all fell apart and it, and, it, and it went down in flames. It's a very, very good podcast worth listening to. But let me tell you the ending. The host, uh, who's Mike Cosper, kind of brings the listeners back to this, this central question he asks throughout it. And he says, who killed Mars Hill? That's kind of the central question of the whole podcast. And he says, if this is so widespread, this idea of, of following every wind of teaching and, and then it crashes and burns and then we follow the next wind of teaching, if this is so widespread, okay, uh, if it just keeps happening, if it's not just about Mars Hill or just about Mark Driscoll or for that matter, James McDonald, Perry Noble or Bill Hybels, 
Isn't there a bigger cultural issue, Cosper asks? Isn't there something broader to look at, like ourselves, he says. When we ask why this happens, shouldn't we be asking why we keep doing it? Why we seem to like charismatic figures whose character don't align with their gifts? Giving them platforms and adulation, Cosper suggests. So who did kill Mars Hill, he said. Maybe we all did. And this is what Paul is getting at in this text. He's saying, we need to stop keeping our sails down. We need to stop being blown about by the winds of teaching and, and understand, look in the mirror long enough to say, I'm an immature, I'm a, I'm an immature Christian. I'm stuck in infancy. I'm, my, my growth is stunted. <laughs> I'm not growing, you know? And that's what Paul is trying to drive us to. But look at this. Now he drives us into, okay, here's the contrast. That's what stunted growth looks like. But here's what healthy growth looks like. Healthy growth starts with one thing. Let's look at the text again. Instead, he says, this is the contrast, speaking the truth in love. We will in all things grow up into him who is the head. That is Christ. Mm. Good stuff here. Okay, let's dig into it. What does it start with? It starts with truth. I want to bring that up first. Healthy growth must be centered around truth. Truth, truth, truth. And then that truth must be spoken. <laughs> and then that truth must be spoken in love. Write those things down. And, and I put truth first because so often we get this wrong. We speak way too quickly. <laughs> and truth must come first. And, and I'm not talking about, you know, I have my truth and you have, you have your truth. We hear that a lot in our culture these days. A lot of people love to talk about how truth is relative. It's not relative. It can't be. Because truth eventually is going to come to blows. My truth with your truth. And you say, oh, well, that's not true. That can, that can actually exist. You can have your truth, my truth. Okay, great. Then, then why don't I just take a Hitler approach on you, and I will you know, eliminate most of your family and keep the rest as my slaves. And you shouldn't be able to have a problem with that because that's my truth. Just accept it. You have your truth that that's wrong, and my truth says it's okay. See? It doesn't work, folks. So we do have to start with truth, and truth is not relative. There's absolute truth. Amen. But again, it's so important that we see what that's found in. Remember? The object. The object of our faith, the object of our knowledge must be in Christ. And we're going there. That's what healthy truth spoken in love. Now, again, let me, let me just go off on a little bit on this. Can I just say this about truth spoken in love? Timing, tone, and context matter. In the church, we've done irreparable harm to this verse because I go and I say, Brother CJ, it's good to see you. I'm just going to speak the truth to you in love. And I just lay that blanket over Brother CJ, and then I just rip him a new one. And I give it to him with all the flesh I got inside of me. Blah! Who cares that everybody heard me? And I just ruin him. But I, but I said, I quoted scripture, speaking the truth in love. Timing matters. Put yourself in the shoes of somebody else when you're actually going to sit down with them and say some hard things. It matters, the timing. What's going on in their life? Maybe it's not the right time. Tone matters. You know, we learned that in, in kids camp this week. I can't speak to some of these kids the way I do my own kids, right? I got to be careful, okay? I got to think about my tone. That really does matter. And then also context matters. You know, if there's people around that shouldn't be hearing what I got to say to my brother or my sister, I need to think about the context that I'm in. And I, okay, it can wait because I don't want to do this in front of his family or I don't want to talk to him in front of these other members of the church, right? So, so context matters. Here's a good rule of thumb. I think the Spirit gave me this kind of statement and I want you to write it down. Before you speak the truth, lowercase t, has the truth, capital T, spoken to you? Ask yourself that question. Before you go speaking the truth in love, has the truth, capital T. And I say that because Jesus said to his disciples, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. So when you feel that urge that you need to say something hard to a friend in the, in the body, to a family member, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But go to Jesus first. Go to the truth. He's the source. He's the head. We go to him, you pray it out, even you fast maybe, and you go to God and you pray. And then once he has spoken to you through prayer and through the word, then 
you're ready to share truth with somebody. Can I just say that? That's a really good rule of thumb. We should really all do that. It's the only way to do it. And so moving on, healthy growth looks like truth spoken in love. And also healthy growth looks like growing up. (laughs) And you might say, well, that's obvious, right? Well, no, it's not so obvious sometimes. Because remember, a lot of us are Christians with our sails down. We're flying about and we aren't growing. But what does growing up look like? Paul, back to the text, Paul says this, we will in all things grow up into him. Okay? So let me break that down. He, he says this growth that we're talking about is certain growth. He says we will. Right? This is not just, oh, it, it will probably happen. This is Dr. Paul saying, no, when, you do, when these things are in place, you will grow. It's certain growth and it's complete growth. He says in all things. In all things you will grow. I mean, that's really a, a bold statement. But guys, this comes down to our, our faith. What do you really believe? See, we'll, we'll read stuff like this, but then we will second guess the word of God immediately after we've read it and say, yeah, that's nice. Paul believed that. But I've seen what's happened in the church in the, you know, the centuries before me, and it's just not true. It's never going to happen. And we wonder why we don't see the fullness of Christ in our day, because we don't really believe it. You've got to have the faith to believe and say, I believe in what Paul's saying here. It can, be, it can be experienced. I'm certain. It's complete. That's what Paul's talking to us about here. And there's one last thing. It's a growth that is into something. It's a growth that is into something. It has a direction. It's going somewhere. It's not just a growth into one another. That's not enough. It's not a growth for the sake of being able to have a nice Facebook page uh, page for our campus so that people see us and they love us. No, it's a growth into something. It's a growth into Christ. Growing up into him who is the head, that is Christ. Amen. Now, think about that for a second. That is so interesting. We're talking here about headship, folks. Healthy growth looks like understanding that there is headship in the church. And actually, this is right where where Paul starts on the whole headship discussion that he really digs into, into chapter five, when he talks about the husband and the wife. He speaks of headship there, how Christ is the head of a marriage, and and the the one that directly reports to Jesus in a a husband and wife is the husband first, okay? And that's why he speaks then of headship of the husband with the wife, and it's not a submissive thing as as in like, you know, you're lesser than me or anything like that. It's so misconstrued. No, it's talking about the fact that just like Christ is the head of the church, okay? So the husband is the head of the wife, and the husband represents Jesus to the world. The wife represents the church to the world. It's a beautiful picture of what God has done. But he's saying, understand headship here. Jesus is our head, guys. And there's, there's a part that's his part, and there's a part that's our part. I want to bring this out and bear it out as we look at the text again. There's his part. Let's talk about his part first. It says, verse 16, from him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows. Think about that for a second. That picture is so cool. And I, I, you know, when I'm reading scripture, I think to myself, what was Paul doing? Where did this come from that he thought of this analogy? And it made me think of me and, me and Ginger because some of you might not know my wife, Ginger's a doctor. And, and actually, did you know there was a doctor that traveled with, with Paul? Anybody know his name? Luke, okay? Luke, who wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts, was a, also a physician as well as a, as a really good uh, journalist because he, he, man, he investigated everything with Jesus, wrote the book of Luke from just eyewitness testimonies from everybody and interviewed everybody. Amazing writer, uh, but he was a doctor. And I can just imagine Paul sitting and talking with Luke saying, Luke, help me understand, like, I'm trying to get this across about Jesus and how he's everything to the church. And I bet you Luke was like, you know what? It's kind of like, makes me think of the head and the body and how the, the spine, you know, is the, the structural piece that comes out of the head. And then all the bones connect to that. And then through the spine comes the, you know, the nervous system and, the, and, and, and all the nerves go through the body and all that. See, Luke understood all that. And I'm sure that as they had these great conversations, Paul's like, that's it. That's the perfect analogy. And that's exactly, and most of you have taken anatomy, right? You understand that, you know, Mary, Queen of Scots understood this, that if you cut the head off, what happens? I no longer have an enemy, right? And so poor, poor lady thought everybody was her enemy, so lots of people lost their heads. But yeah, if you chop the head off, it's, it's lights out. Nothing's going to happen from that point on. So the head is so important, 
And, and Jesus is our head. It says that he holds everything, he's held together, every supporting ligament, everything is held together. That's his part. He holds everything together. John, uh, John in his gospel, John chapter 1, it says that in the beginning was the word, Jesus, and the word was God. The word was with God. All things were created through him and by him and for him, and in him all things hold together. Isn't that cool? So this wasn't just Paul's thought. This was John the, the apostle, the closest to Jesus' thought, was that Jesus holds everything together. Isn't that nice to know he holds us all together? Just like the tendons and the bones and the nerves of our body hold everything together, that's what Jesus is, that's his part. Now what about our part? Let's get to that. Our part looks like this. We gotta do our part. And, and I, I'm gonna borrow from the New Living Translation on our part. I love how the New Living Translation puts this verse. Read this with me. Uh, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. That's, that's a good summary. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. Oh my goodness. Listen to how that, again, as, as each part does its own special work, special, did you, do you know you're all specialists? Every one of you in the body of Christ is a specialist, okay? Wilson is a specialist, okay, of taking uh, and putting together trash bags, all right? All right, so a specialized servant of, of trash bags and taking out the trash this past week in Vacation Bible School. Amy Brown, our missionary, a specialist at teaching students in Austria. And there she was sharing those gifts with us and telling us about what she does across the, the big ocean uh, doing, doing her work for Christ. We had specialists like my mom in the nursery dealing with little kids for for. Was it three hours? Four hours? Three hours? Uh, every evening? It was a long time to be with little kids, right? <laughs> we had specialists in basketball, soccer. Uh, we had specialists in cheerleading. We had specialists doing snacks. We had specialists over at, at Soul on Fire Pizza praying while we were here doing the other work. And guess what? Every piece and every part is important, and we all do our special work, whether it's seen by everybody or unseen, and as we do our special work and put our nose down and we do it unto the Lord, guess what happens? It helps the other parts grow. I'll tell you very well, again, just to pick on Amy, because of what Amy shared this week with our kids, I'm just speaking for me. Hearing what God's been doing through that ministry in her, in her school over there in Austria, it's helping me grow, listening to her tell the stories. And I hope you spend time talking to her before she's out today or before she goes back in another week, right? Okay, she's going back soon. Pray with her, pray for her, because hearing her talk this week helped me grow. And that's exactly, you know, sometimes it doesn't even take a conversation. You just watch somebody serve with passion and do it unto the Lord, and it helps you grow. So guys, there's, there's special work for each of us to do. And we don't need, a, we don't need credit. We just need to do our work unto the Lord, and guess what happens? We help each other grow. It's a, that's our part. And there's one more part I want to talk about as we close. Love's part. Love's part. Oh, did you notice that Paul comes back to love? And this is, we're not talking about friendship love. We're not talking about family love. We're not talking about romantic love. We're talking about agape love. Right, Janer? Okay? Agape love. That's the one love that Jesus talked about most in the Greek is that that kind of sacrificial love, the kind of love that took Jesus from the cradle to the cross, okay? That love, and Paul comes back to it. And I, again, I'm gonna borrow from the message translation for the last verse. I love how Eugene Peterson puts this. He keeps us in step with each other. His very breath and his blood flow through us, nourishing us so that we will grow up healthy in God, robust in love. I love that. Isn't that awesome? Think about this now in, in light of, of the, the one last system I didn't mention, the circulatory system in the body, right? Blood flows through us, and, and another commentator, Warren Wiersbe, says that love is the circulatory system of the Christian body. Love is that place where when the blood goes through our body, what is the blood carrying to every corner of our body? Oxygen. <laughs> and Jim loves to talk about this in the Word, Breath, oxygen, what does that all represent in, in Scripture? The Spirit. The Spirit. Okay, the love that we share, the love that we're able to enjoy is because 
The blood of Jesus Christ and the oxygen that he brings is that breath of God that God breathed into Adam to give him life. That breath that Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, have the Holy Spirit. Okay, he breathed on them. He wants to breathe that oxygen into our body right here and to bring about, to bring about the life that we have in the spirit, the oxygen that only he can give. That's love, guys. And that's the love that we need to attain to, that we need to look to. And I want to just apply this down for you, just a few thoughts. What do we do with this? What do we do with this? This is our family right here. This is our family. You see this picture. This is the church family. And I think it beautifully represents who we are as Lorraine Campus. This is us. Now, I ask you, who or what is the object of your faith and knowledge? Who is it? Who do you pursue? Who is the one that is the, the object of your faith and knowledge? Because for some of you, the object of your faith and knowledge is something you've learned on the street. The object of your faith and knowledge is, you know what, you do unto me, I'm going to do right back unto you. But Jesus is there saying, no, I'm the standard. I say to you, forgive those who sin against you. As far as your enemies, love them. That's what Jesus said. He's the standard. That's tough. But if your object is what you've learned on the street, then guess what? You're going to do what they do on the street. But that, if that's your head, you're leading towards destruction. If you're, if you're looking at Jesus and he's your head, then guess what? It's leading towards life. Here's another thing I want you to think about. Scoreboard. Man, the scoreboard, measure yourself against the character of Jesus only. No comparisons. Jesus is our model. Don't measure yourself based on anybody else or anything else. Measure yourself on the character of Christ alone. Loving God, loving people living surrendered. And finally, don't settle for baby Christianity. Don't think it's enough to just come to church every Sunday and that's it. And I'm not, I'm not advocating for you getting busy because getting busy in the church doesn't make you a better Christian or save you or any of that stuff. God loves you just the way you are. What I'm talking about is if you want to mature you got to get linked into the body. You got to get linked in together. You got to get vulnerable. You got to walk together. You got to love each other. You got to relate to one another like Jesus did. And too many of us are wandering around the lake that is life and our sails are down. Instead, we need to catch the wind of Jesus Christ. He is our captain. He is the wind. He sends the wind of the spirit. And all of a sudden, stability comes because we're catching his wind and we're going the way he wants us to go. Amen? That's my challenge to you this morning. Get those sails up. Catch the wind of the Spirit this morning. And let's start loving each other in Him. And you know what? Every month we come together at the table to break bread to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. And I bring this image up because for some of you this morning, you're on this side of the cross. For some of you this morning, you're on this side of the cross and your heart is broken, your heart is messed up, your life is messed up, you don't think you're forgivable. And I'm here to tell you, yes, you are. No one is outside the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. And you may have had people even tell you that you're a lost cause, you are not. Jesus said it with his life, with his blood and his body broken for you on the cross, saying, you are worth it. I love you this much and I will put my life on that cross for you and I will die. So yes, you can simply say to him, I believe. I believe in what you did for me. It covered everything, Jesus. I'm yours. So you can say that right now. And when you do that, guess what happens? That broken heart is made whole. And you are renewed. You are made a new creation by what Jesus did for you. And with every bit of the Spirit's power that raised Jesus from the grave, guess what happens? Your life is made new. You are raised up in Jesus. You have a new purpose, a new future. You have a new family right here, look around the room, right? Amen. And so because of that, that's why every month we celebrate the table. Because as a body, we, get, we can get lazy and forgetful. We come back to the cross. We come back to communion so that we remember what Jesus did for us. So guys, you can bring the bread down. Go ahead and bring the bread down or wherever it's coming from. Go ahead and pass those out. And you have these little crackers that are gonna represent the body of Jesus. And as it comes around, I want you to think about that night that Jesus was around the table with his disciples one last time. 
I say it one last time before the cross because he, he was around the table with him after the cross too, plenty. As he was with them that night, Passover meal, they had cups full of wine, which is the traditional drink of that day. They had food that was all representative of the Passover lamb being, being slain. And Jesus is basically saying, guess what guys, I'm that Passover lamb. After this day, you're never gonna have to do this over and over again because once for all, my body, my blood will pay the price just like that Passover lamb would do for a time. My payment will be secure permanently for those who believe in me. So Jesus took a loaf of bread, not anything like we're giving you right now. It's just representative. He took a full loaf of bread and he said, guys, this is my body. And I bet you when he said broken for you, he took, he took it and he ripped it in two. And I bet you those guys were like, maybe they didn't even catch it until later when they saw him hanging up on that cross, ripped to shreds. He was saying, my body will be ripped apart for you. So as broken as you may feel, guess what? Jesus allowed himself to be broken so that your heart could be made whole. And that's what this bread represents. Let me grab a piece, guys. Thank you. So get that piece of bread in front of you, that little cracker. And you know, it's, it's an, unleaven, un, unleaven, <laughs> an unleavened piece of bread. There's no yeast in it because it represents the fact that yeast is um, in scripture represents sin. Jesus went to the cross and he was without sin. So this bread is unleavened bread without sin. That's what Jesus was for us. So you see why we do this? Remind us of everything that Jesus means to us so that we get motivated. Again, we got a scoreboard, you know? Let's do this. His body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. Oh, and I, I thank you, Jesus, like you did with the disciples. You, you thanked the Father. I thank you, Jesus, for your body. I thank you that you didn't just want this to be head knowledge for us, but even like we just swallowed that bread and it goes into our stomachs, you want it to make that journey to our heart. You want the body and the blood of Jesus to be something that we think about and that we remember and we internalize and it makes us who we are from the inside out. Thank you.